Good evening and welcome to the UN 75 Food Security Workshop of Food Awakening. I am your host for this evening, Maya Elliott, and um, I hope you have a really enjoyable evening. Right, so as I said earlier, um, my name is Maya Elliott and I work for the UK's Global Food Security Programme. Um, at um, GFS, we um, fund, coordinate and disseminate research that will be influential in supporting food security goals. Um, so one of the questions that we get a lot is, how would you define food security? So that's where we're going to start this evening. So food security is defined as um, when all people at all times have access to safe nutrition and sufficient amounts of food in order to leave, lead a healthy and active life. And so often the definition kind of ends there, but in GFS we always include the sustainability clause at the end, because we believe that if our food security comes at the cost of the food security of future generations, then that's not really food security. So it has to be in a way that the planet can sustain into the future. So there's lots of reasons why we urgently need to transform our food system. But one of the ones that everybody is familiar with is um, the health crisis. So we're currently in the middle of a pandemic, but we've also been in the midst of an epidemic for a very, very long time. These graphs here show um, the increase in obesity rates in men, women, girls and boys um, over the past 50 years, so since the 1970. And um, as you can see, there's been a steep increase. And this has huge um, economic and social impacts in society. Um, currently, one in five um, deaths are attributed to poor diets. And one in three of the global population suffer from some form of malnutrition. Um, so this might be undernutrition, um, but it also occurs increasingly in the form of hidden hunger, which means that we consume enough calories, but the foods that we're eating are poor in nutrients, which means that our body isn't getting the nutrients that it needs and therefore encourages and prompts us to eat more and more food. Um, and that results in, you know, having enough calories, but not um, still being malnourished. So as I mentioned, um, undernutrition and hunger is still, um, is for some reason, still happening on this planet where we produce more than enough food for everyone. Um, and uh, we were doing really well at eliminating hunger. Um, but in 2015, the uh, numbers started to pick up again. And so currently, 820 million people um, are going hungry every day. Um, one in four are severely or moderately food insecure. And um, with the current coronavirus pandemic, um, that number could be pushed up even higher by approximately even up to 130 million more people um, facing food insecurity as a result of the pandemic. And as I said, this is mad because we are producing enough food to feed everyone. Even if we have an expanding population into the future, um, we produce so much food, but our food system is so inefficient. Um, we lose a lot of food, we waste a lot of food. And so this graph here just shows that um, the amount of food that is lost and wasted, and particularly in Europe and North America and Oceania, um, we see that consumers waste a lot of food that otherwise would have been perfectly edible. Um, so learning to address this challenge is really important from a kind of food security perspective, but it's also really important from a climate change perspective. Because if, um, when our food is wasted, it goes to landfill traditionally. And um, when it's a landfill, it produces a gas called methane, which is far more potent than CO2 in trapping heat in the atmosphere and causing global warming. And this is already having um, severe impacts in parts of the world that have actually contributed the least to global warming um, historically. Um, and we can see that this is a projection of into the future. This is um, expected increase and in de decrease in crop yields um, between the years 2070 and 2100. Um, and essentially what we're seeing is that as global temperatures rise in the northern hemisphere, we're going to be able to produce more food. We're going to have higher yields um, unless 
um, of course, we are hit by extreme weather events, which we will be. But as you can see, um, crop yields are declining all across equatorial regions, particularly, particularly in Africa. So we urgently need to reshape the food system. And um, the reason why we can't wait for it to be, we can't wait to do this till tomorrow or next year or in 10 years time is because if current trends continue, we will need to have 42% more land um, by 2050 in order to produce our food. And by all good estimates, there is no new land available for um, agriculture. Um, and we'll also be uh, forced to cut 14% more forest. And that doesn't seem like a lot, but on a global scale, that is massive. Um, and the reason why we need to do that is because um, the diet that we currently consume, um, which is high in animal products, takes a lot of land to produce. So um, we've all heard about the kind of land impacts of beef, but even chicken, you wouldn't think that it takes that much land to grow chicken. But actually, when you consider the grain that it takes to feed the chicken and the land it takes to grow that grain, um, then suddenly that land footprint becomes much, much bigger. Um, another thing to consider is the fact that animals are very inefficient at converting the energy and the protein that is in their feed into uh, energy and protein that we then consume in the form of their flesh or uh, other animal products. Um, so essentially, we are losing huge amounts of energy and protein uh, in our current supply chain. The good news is, though, is that we can shift um, to more land efficient diets by shifting towards more plant based diets. Another reason why we urgently need to transform the food system is that if we continue as we are, we'll be requiring 120% more fresh water for agriculture by 2050. And this is problematic because um, according to the World Resources Institute and the modeling that they've done, um, a lot of countries that are not currently that water stressed will be experiencing severe or high water stress um, by the year 2040. Um, so it's not unthinkable that we will be experiencing water wars within our lifetime. Um, it's also important to note that agriculture currently uses 70% of all fresh water that is accessible to us on Earth. So I'm no mathematician, but um, if we're requiring 120% more fresh water and we're currently using 70% of all fresh water, um, that just doesn't add up. So we need to change. And then finally, uh, another metric that we need to consider is the amount of greenhouse gases that our food system produces. So I already touched a little bit on food waste, but um, just to give you an idea of the scale of the challenge um, in the food system, um, if the blue bar here is the, um, is the total amount of greenhouse gases that we are allowed to, um, or that we are currently emitting, next slide please we would need to approximately halve that in order to um, stay below two degrees global warming. Um, now, unless we decarbonize the food system and we reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that we're producing, um, then uh, our agriculture alone is going to account for most of that carbon budget. Next slide, please. Leaving only that tiny little gray bar there for everything else, such as industry, transport, um, heating our homes, um, our electronic devices, all that. And then finally, I just wanted to talk about this, and I hope that we'll have more discussion about this later in the panel. Um, but injustice is something that is so deeply entrenched in our food system at the moment. I already talked about climate injustice a little bit, where the countries that are contributing the least to climate change will be suffering, are already suffering the most, and will continue to as a result of climate change. Um, but there's also deep-rooted uh, racism in the food system. A lot of our food is grown on land that has been stolen from indigenous people. Um, there is a food segregation, which is rife in uh, everywhere, um, where um, people um, of certain ethnicities aren't able to access the same uh, nutritious food and safe food as white people. Um, there's gender inequality in our food system. Um, women tend to have a much higher chance of being food insecure than men. Um, 
exploitation of migrant labor is something that happens on a global scale. And there's a gener generational injustice as well, um, where the problems that we're experiencing today, instead of actually owning up to them and um, fixing them, we are pushing them onto future generations to deal with. So you may be asking at this point, how do I sleep at night? Um, and <laughs> the answer is that because the food system is so incredibly um, interconnected and because food fundamental to every single human being on the planet. Um, we are all connected through food and everything that we do comes back to food. So um, a great example um, demonstrating this is the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Now when we tend to think of um, food and food security, uh, we think of Sustainable Development Goal 2, which is zero hunger, and um, number which is good health and well-being. So, but when you actually look below the surface, um, food ties into every single one of those sustainable development goals. You cannot have a quality education without food. You cannot reduce inequality um, without addressing food inequality. You cannot ensure good life on, life on land, better life on land and better life in water, unless you uh, have a sustainable food system. So the beauty of it is, is that if we transform the food system to meet our global challenges, then we can create a better world for everyone. And acknowledging the fact that global change starts at home, the Global Food Security Programme um, set up a, uh, an, a scenarios exercise um, a few years back where we got an expert team of academics to come up with four different scenarios of what our future what our food system would look like if we were to transform it to meet global challenges. Um, this report will be uh, launched next month, but in the meantime, I'd like to give you a little bit of a, uh, a taster of what those four scenarios are like. And it's very important to note here that um, we don't, we haven't tried to predict the future, and we also are not advocating for one of these futures. These are just to stimulate thought. So please enjoy. Food is an essential part of our everyday lives. It's vital for our health and survival. But food is so much more than just what's on our plates. It's a way for us to connect with our family and friends and a bridge between different people and cultures. But despite the overwhelming importance of food, many of us don't realize that our food system is under threat. The natural systems that we rely on to grow our food are beginning to buckle under the pressure of our increasing demands, unsustainable practices and climate change, whilst allowing one in nine of us to go hungry every day. Thankfully, the agricultural and industrial revolutions of the past prove that we are capable of rapidly transforming our food system when we work together. To picture what the UK food system could look like in 2050 if we transformed it to meet global challenges, let's explore four hypothetical scenarios, each with its own advantages and pitfalls. The first scenario describes a low emission future where domestic food production is boosted by the UK's world leading, ultra efficient low carbon technology. More food is homegrown making the UK less vulnerable to global food shocks and decreasing the negative impacts of the UK diet in other countries. However, the mechanization of the food supply chain has increased unemployment and rising food prices have reduced food choice. Malnutrition and food banks are commonplace. The countryside is dominated by mega farms that produce food and energy leaving little space for wildlife and recreation. In the second scenario, the UK food system is characterized by the drive for sustainability and a local production for local consumption ethos. The UK's wealth and land have been redistributed amongst the population, giving rise to a new generation of farmers who have diversified food production and boosted biodiversity. Local markets are at the heart of society, reviving the UK's forgotten foods, seasonal eating and creative ways to use food excess. 
Public policy is designed to make nutritious, climate-friendly food accessible to everyone. Although the youth have developed strong food ethics, older generations remain nostalgic for the abundance of cheap, unsustainable foods they grew up with. This causes generational tension, especially when UK food production is disrupted by extreme weather. The third scenario describes a food system that's been decarbonized by replacing agricultural land with plantation forests and renewable energy farms. The UK is largely dependent on food imports, with only a handful of large-scale commercial food producers remaining. To protect the UK from global food shocks, supermarkets have shifted from just-in-time supply chains to maintaining huge stockpiles of long-life, fortified, ready meals. Fresh and whole foods are increasingly harder to come by. Carbon pricing was central to achieving this food system, but lack of support for rural communities and the poorest in society has deepened inequality and mental health problems. In the fourth hypothetical scenario, global governance and trade arrangements determine which foods are grown in which parts of the world to maximize yields and improve sustainability. The UK's primary export is red meat, with a world-class livestock system that emits minimal greenhouse gases while supporting biodiversity and reforestation. However, it's a luxury product, so the UK population eats mostly plant-based protein. This shift has reduced diet-related diseases and created space for wildlife to flourish. Technology has made the global food system low carbon and fully transparent, and most food production and supply chains are managed through cooperative structures. Citizen assemblies now inform UK food system policy, but it's taken a long time to increase public participation. This lag has allowed special interest groups to capture these platforms to sow doubt over the sustainability agenda. These scenarios describe just four of the countless possible futures that we could face if we reshaped our food system to meet today's global challenges. But they all have things in common, such as changing dietary habits, reducing food waste, and paying the true cost of food. These changes may seem overwhelming, but business as usual is simply not sustainable. In a world connected through food, transforming our food system means so much more than just our continued survival. It's a revolution to create a better world for all of us. And just like the agricultural and industrial revolutions before it, this revolution will take collaboration, innovation, and a willingness to change. Our world is in our hands. So um, thank you very much for watching uh, that and for uh, familiarizing yourselves with our four scenarios. Um, as you can tell, the future won't necessarily be peachy just because we addressed um, some global agreements. It means that we have to do more and it's going to be a continual process. Um, so yeah, so um, what we did uh, earlier today was we showed the scenarios to a group of cross-stakeholder um, intergenerational uh, expert working group. And uh, they analyzed these and they came up with a, a draft list of um, actions that could be used to transform the food system to meet global challenges in a way that is um, just in a way that is plausible, systemic, and ambitious. And so these are the actions that we're going to be discussing uh, this evening um, with the help of an expert panel. Um, now, very important to say that um, the best policies are made by people who go out and speak to the people who will be affected or who are being affected. Unfortunately, we can't do that with our future selves. Um, but what we've done is we have um, used or employed the help of a storyteller to really transport us into those futures. And I think that this evening when you're coming up with different actions, um, it's very important to come from a place of empathy and to really put yourselves in the shoes of people living in those futures. 
It's not even 8.30 in the morning and Nairi already finds herself in an argument she didn't want to have. Her daughter, V, is point blank refusing to go to her cousin's 21st birthday due later that evening. I can't believe you booked us all to go there, says V, throwing her lunch things into her bag like a person smashing plates. I forgot, V. I'm sorry, but listen, Nairi reads from her phone. Our nationally renowned dishes are made with the finest grass and insect fed beef and always accompanied by the freshest seasonal vegetables from the UK's most reputable farms. Look, I'm sure they'd make you something plant based if we phoned ahead, V. V affects not to be impressed and instead hovers her phone over the crumpled wrapper on the table in front of her mother. And I should also inform you, Mum, that the factory workers who produce the breakfast bar you just ate are not being paid a living wage. You just don't care, do you? She gives Nairi the most insufferable look, swinging her bag over her shoulder. See you later, maybe. The door slams shut. Nairi takes a deep breath and she looks out of the patio doors at the sumptuous green of the downs and drinks it in for a moment. She feels guilty, but only a little. V is technically vegetarian, but it's only been a week since she was wolfing down roast chicken. A month ago, she was hell-bent on giving up sugar for all of two days. At her rate, she'll be eating meat again by the end of her first lecture and on a wheat-free diet by tea time. Nairi tries to think back to a time when it was all simpler, when food didn't come complete with a code of ethics, but... She realises she can't. V will come round anyway, thinks Nairi. She sends her daughter the restaurant link. There is a reason they're so well regarded and expensive. And besides, V loves Ad and family get-togethers. It's Ad's 21st birthday today, you see, and Nairi plans to really treat her nephew. He's a good kid. Her brother, JJ, would be so proud of the young man he's grown up to be. Across town... Ad is groggy as he drives his forklift out of the charging station down to the docks. The hollow rattle of empty hulls hitting the dockside sings him awake as he pops up and guzzles weak tea, looking out at the blue and red stacks of refrigerated containers dripping sea salt on the tarmac and coiled ropes. The lorries bringing the beef for export are lined up and ready. Ad has been watching these containers loaded onto ships for the last four years. Tonight, he supposes, he will find out what all the fuss is about. He's nervous about what to wear tonight. This restaurant is the kind of place where the tablecloths are made of better material than your shirt, where every slice of veg has got its own folklore. It's famous and not the kind of place that Ad would ever think of going to himself. His mother, Sarah, had offered to go halves with Nairi on Ad's birthday meal, but that was before she'd realised where they were actually going. Fortunately, Nairi wouldn't hear of it. She told Sarah it was a treat for her as well. It might be Ad's birthday, but you did all the hard work making him. Took the embarrassment out of it for Sarah. She was good like that, Nairi. Like, she'll always talk about Ad's dad, her brother, but she'll never, ever bring up his illness. And if someone else does, she always says something like, well, not all heart problems are down to lifestyle, you know. Read the stats. And she says it with a smile so it shuts people up, but ever so gently. In her kitchen, Sarah is putting a card into an envelope. Inside is a neatly folded piece of paper, her son's birthday present. She hopes he'll like it. It's not exactly an e-bike or a new pair of headphones. It's shares in a local food co-op. Dave, one of the other volunteers at the Green City Work Group, put her onto it. She'd had to scrimp for a few months, but it's definitely worth it. This is the kind of present that will make Ad think ahead and it will keep on giving. And it's a grown-up present for a grown-up boy. Well, young man. 21, she thinks. Beside her, neatly ironed, is the suit she will wear tonight. She runs a hand over a frayed cuff and thinks about the restaurant, the meal, how Nairi will be so kind to her and insist that she sit at the head of the table and suddenly Sarah feels very lonely. She gazes out across the town toward the docks, cranes lifting orange containers onto ships, ships making their way out to the horizon, the horizon swallowing them up until they're gone. 
she can feel her husband's smile from the photograph on the wall behind her. She wipes her eyes and then lifts her mug of tea, glancing round at the photo. Here's to the future, eh, Jay? Whatever it is. So that was our first um, story for this evening, set in a uh, future food system or in a future where we have transformed the food system um, to meet uh, the sustainable development goals and where our food system is more localised than it was today. Um, just for those of you asking, it was intentional um, to start playing the video, but it was just a slight timing issue there. Um, so in the meantime, um, I have the pleasure of welcoming on our first panel, who are um, going to be talking about the global and national actions that we can take um, in order to transform our food system to meet global challenges. Um, just one note, um, if you would like to propose an action, um, please do, but please do it in the questions bar. Um, if you do that and you see someone else's question that you really like or sorry, someone else's action point that you really like, um, please upvote it because the most upvoted actions will be incorporated into our UN75 action plan. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, let's do a quick round of introductions. Um, Pete, would you mind going first? Yeah, so I'm uh, Pete Falloon from the Met Office's Hadley Centre. I'm particularly interested in uh, climate change and how it affects food security and crops. Thank you very much. Lynn, would you mind going next? Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Lynn Davis and I work with the Open Food Network. So we're a global collaboration building open source software tools to support community focused food systems. Um, and uh, we work across 19 countries, uh, and as we've kind of grown in the different countries, we've more and more discovered the importance of trade to go alongside local food systems, so I'm very interested in trade for good. Thank you very much. Paul, would you mind going next? Yeah, it's uh, Paul Newham here from the Sustainable Development Goal 2 Advocacy Hub. So we work with private sector, UN and civil society around food, agriculture and nutrition. Um, and also I represent the Chefs Manifesto, which is a network of chefs in 80 countries around the world tied to the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you very much. Lydia? Hi. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I am a researcher at the University of Bristol in the UK and um, my focus is on work in the food system, in particular agri-food workers in um, horticultural networks for counter-seasonal production, um, so keeping us in, in food year round and looking at their experiences. Thanks. Thank you very much. And finally, Tasha, our youth representative. Hiya. Yeah, so I'm Tasha Mackay Cora, co chair on the youth board at Fight Back 2030. And essentially, we are an organization for young people, run by young people. And our aim is just to reveal the truth about the food system, how it's designed, but also looking at how can we redesign it to make sure that the health, act, the health of young people is put at the forefront of its operations. And we aim to do that through various strategies, but mainly building a powerful alliance with like governments parents, other young people as well, to make sure that this redesign becomes reality. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Tasha. Great. Well, now you've heard the introductions from our uh, expert panel. Um, just to clarify one thing, I see that there's a question from uh, Ron Kang. Um, and uh, GFS is not a UN sub-organisation. Sub we are a um, programme um, that is part of UK research and innovation. Um, so uh, taxpayers' money that goes towards research uh, is disseminated by, by a UK research innovation. And so we kind of focus on the uh, funding, coordinating and disseminating research on food security. Great. OK, um, now I'm going to start off with a question um, from the uh, from the viewers. And um, David has asked, can we not get more food from more, more of our food from the sea and fish farming. Um, 
Now, I don't know if any of you have any specialism or any, uh, any experience working with fish farmers. Um, maybe you probably have the best chance of that, Lynn, maybe. Um, just shake your head if you don't, and I'll, otherwise I'll answer it. Uh, I mean, I can contribute a little. Um, uh, there, like, there are also huge challenges with overfishing and fish farming that's contributed so much in terms of uh, disease to fish stocks and, and the industry in general. So like salmon farming, for example, some of the diseases that now exist in salmon have infected the wild salmon populations. Um, so it is, you know, it is a source of food, absolutely. But I think the same problems of uh, exploiting ecosystems and also fisher people um, across the world exist here as well. So. I see Lydia nodding. Um, have you worked with any fish farmers in your research? Um, I was just going to say no. And then I realised that the supply chain next door to the supply chain that I was looking at, which was counter seasonal production of tomatoes from Morocco, um, was the production of uh, canned fish, so sardines, um, which often come from places like uh, Morocco to the UK. So for the workers that I was interviewing and spending time with for my PhD, one of the alternative jobs that some could turn to or a next door labour market was fish farming. And I would agree with Lynn that it suffers from the same problems, particularly in the kind of highly intensified industrialised side of the food system um, that other sectors do. So, so I think you know, it's a question of can we get more food in any sector? Can we, the, I think the same problems and challenges apply, but um, there's also some opportunities in sustainable farming that I'm sure others could speak to. Thanks. Brilliant. Um, so I hope that that's answered your question. Um, and uh, I think it would be good to kind of address one of the first um, global actions that the expert working group came up with this afternoon. And just to hear the, the thoughts of, um, of the group. Um, so one of the um, global actions was um, to uh, foster a sense of global citizenship and including all of civil society, particularly marginalized groups um, in the discussion of how we transform the global food system. Um, so does anyone have any ideas of how we can foster global citizenship? I'm going to hand this one to uh, you, Paul, if that's OK. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, how we connect global citizenship is through connection. And, and I think it's building empathy in people and connection between how they understand the system works. And so, I mean, firstly, it's it's helping people understand that there is a system that creates our food, um, because I think, you know, many of us have become very disconnected from that system where we, we just see food appear and expect it to be available. Um, and so I think, you know, getting that connection and connecting um, food in that way is really important. I think some of the ways that we've approached that is to try and um, ensure that we're not using too much technical jargon. Um, so not trying to, I think sometimes when we look at this from a science perspective, we, we have very deep knowledge. And the challenge with that is that as we are in now um, scientific space, debating and discussing policy um, interventions, um, that can sometimes get disconnected from the everyday conversation around, that people have around food. And so what we try and do is put the conversation back into a, into a framework that enables people um, to, to understand. We've done quite a lot of work also with chefs, um, and part of the reason for that was to help um, connect the people that kind of taking the ingredients and putting them into dishes and trying to give extra knowledge around food to enable people to understand that. So I think, you know, um, one of the, the, the key things is building that empathy. I also think there's a whole um, piece of work around cross-border engagement. And so really acknowledging the cultural dimensions of food 
um, and that has connections also to religion, to um, traditions, culture, indigenous cultures. And as you start to understand where, where our food traditions come from, it also creates a connection point to another level around that food, simply more than just, you know, calories or nutrients. Thank you very much. Um, Tasha, do you have any idea of how we could um, foster global citizenship amongst, uh, like, younger generations? How we can embed yeah. it? Yeah, I think just to add on to what um, Paula said in terms of connection, but also bringing those marginalised groups into the conversation as well. And that is one reason why I joined Bike Back, because there, there have been other, you know, food organisations, food campaigns that have been running way before Bike Back was, um, was founded. But the difference is that we had grown-ups talking about young people and young people were not at the table. And so for me, one thing that stands out about Bike Back is that we actually have young people at executive board level all the way down um, the system who are contributing their experiences about their food environments and what they want to see. And I think that brings a lot of value in terms of the changes that we're able to implement within the food system as well. But it's, it's, it's also value in how we maintain it because it's good enough you know us transforming the food system and then it lasts a couple of years 10 years but how do we sustain it and make sure this is an ongoing thing it's definitely bringing the marginalized into the conversation thank you very much um pete there's a question in the uh in the questions bar that i was hoping you might be able to maybe feed into a little bit um, I know that you work with uh, quite closely with governments in order to project kind of what what might the future what might the food system look like in the future and how will how will it be affected by climate change? Um, someone has asked how much money and investment would it take to transform the food system on a global scale? And I was wondering if you've done any work around that. Um. <laughs> Not, not that I'm aware of. No, I mean, I think uh, I, I don't know. I think um, the dawning of the awareness that there's a need for transformation rather than um, incremental, you know, uh, step by step change is, is a relatively new thing. I think that's something uh, that partly uh, came out of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the, the one and a half degree warming report that they did also. Um, closer to home in the UK um, we have a climate change risk assessment that's done periodically um, and work that the global food security has been, uh, been working on as well that you know have, have pointed to the need for quite transformative changes um, I'm yeah I'm not aware uh, unless I guess I work more in the physical and biological side of systems than the economical so yeah I'm not aware of that I, I think quite a lot of analysis has been done on what happens, you know, the map you showed earlier of the changing patterns of crop production, of what that means on a macroeconomic scale. But, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm much less sure. So I'm not sure we're quite there at answering yet. But that's that's actually a very good question and we just, as we decide how to take this forward in the research sense. So thank you. Thank you. Is it fair to say that the cost of not transforming the food system will be much higher than transforming the cost or the cost of transforming the food system? In the long run, I would imagine so, yeah. Uh, the short term is probably a different matter, but yeah. That's great. That Thank you guess. very much, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's also um, one question which I was wondering if uh, you'd be able to help us answer, uh, Lynn, which is how can we make plant-based food options more widely accessible? Um, and probably not just in the UK, but on a global scale. Yeah, I mean, it is a it's a good question, because um, as you pointed out in the slides at the start, the production of meat and uh, or particularly the feed for meat is devastating. But it's not only meat that's devastating. The production of palm oil, for example, can also uh, significantly impact communities um, in terms of making it accessible. I think I think with any a lot of plant based food, there's a technology element to it. Um, and I think this, it's very important in, when we start to think about technology and food to explore the owners of that technology and the impact that that has on wealth, re, wealth distribution around the world. So here, I think it, it's important to, to raise the concept of food sovereignty as opposed to food security. Food sovereignty is a term that's come out of 
our social movements around the world, particularly La Via Campesina, a peasants movement of 200 million uh, small scale farmers and land workers around the world. And uh, they've defined food sovereignty as different to food security in that uh, it really addresses the question of power, who holds the power in the food system and how can that power be put back into the hands of communities? Uh, so, so I think like if we're looking at plant-based food systems, um, we need to make sure that we're not just taking a kind of technological approach, which would take that power away, but actually make sure we're thinking about, uh, you know, how do we support and create the infrastructure for horticulture, small scale horticulture, veg production, so that this food can be more accessible to the people where they live rather than through high tech supply chains. Okay, brilliant. Um, so another global action that was, um, actually, no, let's move on to the national actions, um, because one of the um, kind of key themes in every single scenario that was analysed, um, it was raised that we need to embed education on food health and food system sustainability um, and connection to nature into the national curriculum. Um, and so um, I think that that's, I think that that's a kind of a bit of a no-brainer given that it was like you said earlier it's, it's about engaging the next generation so that we don't have um so that we just wake up with this or grow up with this awareness that there is such a thing as the food system um is there anything that uh, anyone would like to add in terms of uh, education lydia yeah i think um just to add that i think it's not just theoretical knowledge about the food system that we need to add into kind of our learning and education sort of journeys but also the ability to grow food you know the the, the practical skills so that when people grow up they they know how to plant seeds they know how to even if it's just in your garden even if it's just um in your kitchen knowing how to to have some sort of solid basic cooking and growing skills and also for that to lead towards careers, be that in gardening, be that in horticulture, be that in farming. And I think on the bigger scale, that could help increase the um, social status of, of farm workers, of uh, be they kind of um, self-sufficient landowning workers or be they um, workers who earn a wage, a small or a large wage, um, so that so that 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 there is a generalised appreciation that growing food is an important thing to do and that everybody has a basic understanding of. Thanks. Thank you. Would anyone else I'd like to add anything more about embedding food education in the curriculum? Yeah, I think there's also probably a role for businesses and companies to educate their consumers. Um, so when we look at food labelling, historically, it's been quite complicated to kind of unpack all the, you know, the jargon that is surrounding nutrition and consumers have you know been able to figure out what is inside their food what is what what are they eating the nutritional element of you know the food that they're buying so i think there's a this, this, this responsibility that companies have to make sure that their food labels are pretty clear in terms of is it healthy for you what is inside so that it makes that the whole um food finding navigation a lot easier for the customers and therefore it's a lot easier for them to engage with the system that's great thank you yeah, Tasha. I Pete. Yeah, I think something else that's really important in that is is developing well, we the connection. Sorry, oh, you hear me now? Is that good? Am I back? Yeah, yeah, you can hear me. Okay, yeah, something that's really important is is I think developing the interconnected thinking. Um, I think you know we're talking about food systems and not just one part of it, and actually. Um, that's something I think we've been moving towards in, in the sciences and in other areas in broader senses. When I first went to university, I went on an environmental science course that brought together various strands of physical sciences. But it's more than that that we need now. There's social, political aspects. But in the food system sense, we need people who understand that end to end thing, the production, the transport, the processing, the retailing, the consumption and, and the health and these food systems thinkers, it's it's that that we need in, in a new generation 
too to take this forward. And I, th I think it, with, the reason that we're not moving faster at that now is that we don't have those those broad skill sets yet. I think they'll come soon. I hope. Thanks, Pete. Um, right. Okay. So we're going to move on um, to one of the questions. Um, so one of the questions has been asked around um, the role of ultra processed foods, so factory manufactured foods, including meat. Um, so do you think that there's a uh, panel? Do you think that there is a uh, role for ultra processed foods in the future? Or do you think it's something that we'll leave behind as we uh, address global challenges? I'm going to start with you, Paul. Yeah, look, I mean, it's an interesting one. Uh, there, I definitely think there, there, there is, as we've just seen with um, the the recent pandemic, you've seen an increase in shelf stable foods, um, and there was also shortages in other parts of the food system in different different communities. So you do see this shift that's kind of where you know people have needed some uh, access to um, processed foods. I, the the term ultra processed foods and stuff is very debatable um and comes up you know um it's kind of often thrown around and debated back and forth um but i think from the concept of shelf like one of the things that we often talk about is shelf stable and so there's different commodities that can be that way as well um and and so thinking about the role that they play in a system as as one part of it i think the reliance on them has been the part of the challenge and i think that hopefully we'll see more diversity in our diets um, in, increasing and that we'll see a more balanced approach to to what people are eating because in some parts of the world you know and this is something particularly in places like the us there's food deserts where ultra processed foods are, are essentially all you can you can get hold of um, and having been and visited some of these these communities it's very very challenging to go and get fresh food um, like we drove around, I was traveling in one part of um, the US with a group of chefs. Oh, we've lost Let connection with Paul. Places. Is he back? Sorry, continue. We just lost you for a second. I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Is it working? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I think I think the the the, the challenge is that we have many systems, and I think that um, these these foods can play a role. Um, but I think the reliance on them is is definitely something that we need to look at. I think um, you know, as as the world becomes increasingly climatically in state, nutritional benefits um, built into each of them and look at how does that um, maybe get regulated in different ways as well. That's great. Thank you, Paul. And that actually ties in a little bit to um, the international legislation, which is something that um, our expert working group um, really focused on. And they said that that has a huge potential to transform the food system um, to address global challenges. So one of the international legislations that they proposed was to um, uh, international legislation that can embed sustainability and transparency in the food system. Um, so ensuring things like waste reduction, sustainable farming practices, protection and regeneration of natural resources like, um, you know, uh, rainforests, um, preventing them from being cut down in order to grow food um, and the correction of food injustices. So ensuring through transparency that um, workers' rights are not being infringed. Um, I mean, that sounds very utopian, um, but I think um, these are the kind of ambitious actions that we should be calling for. Um, are there any considerations that we need to make before we, um, any dangers that might exist if we were to impose, you know, shift towards international legislation um, to improve sustainability and health? Uh I was just going to say one of the things is context. I think it's really important that, you know, there is a role, but there is also very different contexts out there. And I think when you look at food systems, we do need to be context specific. And, and I think even the shift towards plant based foods in some parts of the world is having negative consequences um, on our development agenda in other parts of the world, because 
livestock invest like livestock research for example in our development agenda is is very low and yet livestock contributes fairly highly on the climate front and so if we don't research and we don't improve then we're actually not we're actually not getting the benefit and because there's this shift in perception of you know towards plant-based um in some parts of the world which needs to happen then the development agenda sometimes is is influenced by that and so you you do have to look at context and sometimes in some parts of the world you know an egg or access to animal based protein is is some of the only way to get the micronutrients and mac that you need for basic development thank you paul Lynn, would you like to add yeah sure um i guess just to to explore international legislation it is a incredibly difficult thing to achieve i mean we have a global set of human rights that we are not realizing uh right of the right of indigenous people the right of the peasant has been ratified as a as a set of human rights to protect seed water access to land uh these rights then need to be implemented into national law for them to have any impact otherwise they're kind of that yeah they don't carry any weight until they're until they're fully implemented so um like how looking at the ways that this could be implemented is really important and this might mean things like uh, the responsibility of businesses in supply chains uh, which we've seen have a massive impact with the modern slavery act and recently the consultation on due diligence to forest risk and supply chains that the uk has been doing so there's definitely some progressive actions that could be taken but i think it takes uh yeah like international legislation in itself doesn't carry much weight until you get that push on the ground and in, in within the countries that are going to enforce them yeah and just to add on um i'm always very skeptical when it comes to like a global legislation just in terms of how it's received from like historically marginalized groups and also like the southern part of the world if there's an element of you know western security when it's like you know a group, the UN, imposing their supposed moral values on the rest of the world. So I'm more in favour of global incentives that encourage, you know, nations to become more sustainable in the long run versus it being, you know, legislation that almost imposes or, imposes or forces, you know, uh, nations to, to... I've got a couple of mini points. Uh, one thing on the international law and standards, I, I agree with it, Lynn, I think they're fantastic. And I think... Um, you know, my, most of our challenge is to implement a lot of what we already have in, in law um, or to, in the case of some standards, transpose international law, what is already in international law. And I'd add to the list of really, really good standards, a lot of the legislation in the international labour that's come through the International Labour Organization. So, for example, in my work, there's one very specialist um, convention on um, labor inspection in agriculture. I mean, more labor inspectors in agriculture to um, bring up the, the standards um, of, of work in agriculture by making sure that workers have, you know, access to breaks, access to eating spaces, access to toilets, everything um, would, would have a real impact. Um, so, yeah, that's the thing on, on the legislation. I think we need implementation it, it is a priority. The other thing I wanted to say is about kind of the danger of um, the kind of glamorization of this agri-fix, agri-tech fix, and, and the potential to kind of go, wow, we could have this amazing new meat that's going to save all our problems. And, and that kind of being a diverse, that, that functioning to channel a lot of research and development money towards a kind of very glamorous uh, future of food um, which which actually can detract from some of the things we already know work, um, like small scale farming with diversified um, crops and, and mixed diets and so forth. Um, and the final thing I'm going to push in to say is about transparency and how there's an assumption very op very often that it's transparency for the consumer. And I think there needs to be more transparency going two ways through um, through global uh, production networks so that workers also understand for what countries for whom they're producing so that they can build those links in terms of solidarity through trade unions and so forth brilliant so i'm just gonna um pose a couple of questions to you from the chat um so ingrid has asked um 
She says, I've personally only recently become more aware of the global food security issues. Are you concerned that the majority of the population might not be a, might not yet be aware of this problem? Uh, if so, how can we educate the population and increase awareness? And I think that this ties in nicely to, um, you know, the fact that it is so urgent that we can't really wait to create this transform transformative change for future generations through education. I think we also need to be addressing it, um, you know, in the adult population as well, because at the moment we are the biggest contributors to um, many of the food system problems that we see. And um, so did anyone have any ideas on how we can educate an adult population? I think in the UK, if, if I may, um, Maya, pick up, uh, pick up on this one. I think in terms of um, really gaining popular traction, you know, we, we uh, are quite blessed, if you like, with um, popular sort of science personalities and people like uh, David Attenborough and so, you know, whose groundbreaking documentaries and series have kind of really captured the imagination of, of people in environmental issues. And I think those kind of things can make really quite a big difference and particularly in the in the adult population you know the role of media is really important as well but it, I mean it's also important to get things right in that context uh, which I'd say you know David Attenborough does but you know it's it's sometimes more of a challenge in the press playing the right balance between um, you know the story having enough weight and you know, and being, you know, underpinned by science and so on. But of course, this is much more than just science as well. I think we need to find as well different ways to communicate these messages that have impacts. Um, I, 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 you know, with caution on, on platforms like social media, because they're like all platforms, there are ups and downs to them, you know, and, and issues of trust and things like that become really important. So we, I think we need to find Sources basically and ways to communicate the message in whatever way is appropriate uh, to different audiences around the world. Okay, then we will move on to um, the uh, one of the other um, government national government actions that was proposed by our expert working group. Just to note that we have about ten more minutes left on this panel, so if you did want to propose any. Um, any action points that you think should be taken um, on a global or a national level, please do put them in the questions bar and uh, they might be incorporated into the, um, into the UN 75 action plan. Um, so one of the um, points um, was to set high food standards um, for trade and institutional procurement. Um, and Tasha, I know that you're very passionate about um, high food standards um, for trade. So um, would you mind just briefly expanding on that? And um, maybe you could uh, touch on the agri bill as well. Yeah, so currently the UK is under, you know, post Brexit trade deals at the moment. And there's this push for a lot of food campaigners, including Backback, to maintain our food standards, especially with the new trade deal that we think comes out of, like, the USA. Um, we know that Trump is very much very open against uh, food labels, warning consumers when food has been genetically modified, etc. And so, you know, they're very high on importing food that is that's got that's put that contains a lot of high fructose 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 so corn syrup which is essentially just a type of sugar very ultra processed foods foods that we don't even accept in the uk as imports and so we think that perhaps with the wrong trade bill all of our food standards could be undermined and we'll, we've also had you know boris's um obesity strategy recently introduced again which was um pushing for keto food labels pushing for um the tax levy, the sugar tax levy to be extended to include any who drinks, all of these proposals and policies perhaps could just go down the drain with the wrong kind of trade deal. So I think yes, there is a lot for um there's a lot for the government to do in terms of maintaining our food standards. In comparison to the rest of the world, I think the UK are doing pretty good um in terms of like you know being careful in what we allow in and out of the country. The kind of food that people are eating is very much you know scrutinized. So if, for me, it's about maintaining these three standards and making sure that they're not compromised with any uh, any trade deal that comes out of uh, Brexit. Just a follow up question: um, How do we how do we ensure that we can hold the government to account? I'm always about using your platform to 
keep talking about it, really use your voice to keep nagging the government to do something about it. But also traditional things such as, you know, writing to your MP or write, uh, signing a petition. We had the free school meal petition um, led by Christina, our coach, my co-chair on the board as well, that got over 300,000 signatures with, with the fighting for the, um, the free school meals uh, project to be extended over the holidays. So you wouldn't have thought that people would be interested in free school meals, but it clearly shows that with COVID, the silver lining in it all is just a lot of people have been open to understanding all these health inequalities that we have within society. So there is room for people to genuinely engage in politics, especially when it comes to health. It's just about using our platforms to just talk about it and make sure that our voices are heard. Maybe just to add quickly to that, that... um. Yes, do exactly as Sasha said, engage, uh, talk to, like, get in touch with your MPs and do it now because right at this moment, uh, an amendment to the agricultural bill uh, that is proposed to uh, put, like, guarantee our food standards in law. And this amendment is being bounced by heart between the House of Lords and the House of Commons in ping pong. Um, and uh, basically, our MPs are voting to take it out now is the time to talk to your MPs and request that they keep this in. Thanks, Lynn. I couldn't agree more. Um, right, so um, we have a question from um, Shana for the panel. Um, she said, how can we address going green? Um, but we've seen that the farming of Palma is actually exacerbating things mentioned. So deep-rooted racism, gender inequality and high emissions. So I guess Shana's question is, how can we balance um the kind of shift towards a more um sustainable food system um whilst also balancing all these other factors that we have to juggle um in order to ensure that the transition is just and to ensure that we're not undermining other um other countries or uh, workers or um the environment uh lydia i'm gonna i'm gonna point that one at you if that's okay um, how do we juggle things like workers' rights alongside sustainability and, uh, uh, you know, racial injustices and stuff like that? Okay, um, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, there is. There's, I, I think there's one big point that I want to make, which is that I think we need to do more to take responsibility for the impacts of our food system. And I mean here about the UK. And in that we're talking about the UK, this is a UK case study that we've been asked to engage with. Um, I think we really need to recognise that a lot of the impacts of our food system are happening outside of our national space, of the space of our nation state, however you want to consider it. And the more we rely on imports, the more we subsidise uh, products that we could grow here, um, or do grow here for products grown outside or foodstuffs grown outside the UK, the more the externalities are also falling outside the UK. And so I think as we go forward, um, I'm really concerned that we don't let our that the, the proportion of our food that's consumed in the UK, that's also produced in the UK, to drop. Um, and I think we're at a massive turning point now um, as the common agricultural policy, so those European-wide subsidies going to agriculture uh, potentially can be shifted back to London, and London has to decide, or the UK, and that's, I think, the thing here, we need to make sure that it's not just a few people in London deciding um, how much we value food. Um, and that links to one of the points that came out from the workshop this morning, which was to make sure that subsidies going to food definitely go to small scale farmers um definitely definitely go to small scale farmers um to make sure that we kind of bring some of those externalities those those um those kind of costs of food social economic um landscape ecological within within kind of a space that we can connect to um and I am also concerned about not just the small farmers as well, because there's been estimates that um, two of every five farms would not be viable without subsidies. So I think that I'd want to see the same amount of economic support going to the food system in the future as is going to it now. 
What I don't want to see is a kind of greenwashing of a few small subsidies going to a few small kind of um, projects and, and, and then essentially food production being offshored. Um, I think we need food systems in the UK to continue and to prosper and be supported. That's great. Thank you so much, Lydia. I'm afraid that's all that we have time for with this panel. Thank you so much, Pete, Lynn, Paul, Lydia and Tasha for joining us and for talking to us about the global and national actions that we can take to transform our food system for health and sustainability. And um, before we move on to the next panel, we're going to show you another brief story set in the future um, where we have transformed our food system again to meet global challenges. But this time um, we have shifted towards a more localized food system. Ad is leaving work a little worse for wear. His shift mates snuck a bottle of wine into the break room and poured him a huge glass. And Ad doesn't actually drink that much really, but you're supposed to enjoy the continental wines, aren't you? Plus, they must have clubbed together for it, and Ad didn't want to waste it. So he necked it on an empty stomach. Well, you only turn 21 once. It felt nice to be toasted. Well, Ad feels well and truly toasted now as he walks his bike home along the Greenway. He's been working at the recycling depot for four years, right? And his shift mates have become true mates. They're all going clubbing for his birthday on Saturday and some of them will probably splash out on fish and chips first. Ad's looking forward to that. But first, there's tonight. It's nearly 6pm and Ad has got to get home sharpish, wash the stink off himself, ready for the fancy dinner at his aunt's house. If he just splashes his face and puts a bit of aftershave on, his mum will be able to tell. She'll insist on him having a shower at her house, water meter or no water meter, and then they'll be late. So Ad breaks into a run, passing an old lady on her e-bike. Across town, Ad's aunt Nairi is at the local food hub looking at the New York baked lemon cheesecakes in the imported goods section, wincing at the price. The tax on them is massive. Still, she puts an extra large one into her basket and checks her phone. Two hours, that's enough. She'd taken the afternoon off work, see, so the ribs are already in the oven on a slow cook, the veg chopped. She would have done chips and a nice salad to go with the meat, much more summery, but the bloke at the farmer's market said that the drought this year is so bad There'll be no decent potatoes or tomatoes till at least September. Anyway, the ribs are the star of the show and this cheesecake will be the cherry on top. I mean, Ad will just be expecting one of her standard homemade cakes, but Nairi wants to make tonight really special for her nephew. His dad would have loved that, not to mention the cheesecake. On the way to the checkout, Nairi doubles back and swaps her two bottles of Cornish white for a couple of proper French champagnes and she swipes a large bunch of bananas from the fruit stand too. Ah, she thinks, he doesn't turn 21 every day. As she waits for the town shuttle home, Nairi can already imagine the look on her daughter V's face though as she gives Nairi a lecture on how American baked cheesecake is an unsustainable bourgeois luxury. She's so busy dreaming up ways to justify the champagne to V that Nairi almost misses her stop. V is at the island in the kitchen at home, writing out her card to add. She's chuffed because she made it herself. It's got a magazine cutout of a bloke in a vintage sports car on the front with a printout of Ad's head superimposed over the bloke's slick-haired grinning face. It's ironic. V loves her cousin, although obviously she'd rather die than tell him that, and he is going to love this card. She briefly wonders whether it's a bit mean, the card, actually, since there's no way Ad could dream of any kind of car, let alone a petrol one like that. But it's ace. The bloke looks like a tool, the way he's leaning back in the seat, and with Ad's slightly too large head stuck over it, looks really funny. Ad will love it, the loser. Ad is back at his flat now, showered and spruced. An open shoebox is on the floor by the sofa, and his mother is on an e-call, her voice coming over the speaker at him. I'm so glad you like them, love. They're in the top ten reviewed ones. They're perfect, Mum. Fit like a glove. I'll wear them on my Sunday hike. Break them in. And I've made you a bilberry sponge cake. I, I would bring it tonight, love, but I'm, I'm sure your aunt has something spectacular up her sleeve. Probably some kind of cucumber mousse, if V has anything to do with it. The loser, grins Ad. Sarah laughs. I'll tell her you said that, my boy. Don't you dare, Mum. She's taller than me now. I'm looking forward to us all getting together tonight, says Sarah. It's been too long. 
You're not going to be late, are you? I've already ordered the taxi for a quarter two. I'll be there in ten, says Ad, folding the wrapping paper. Good, says his mum. Have you had a shower? So that was our um, more localised food system story for you. Um, as you can see, it's quite a positive future. Um, but of course, there are challenges there as well, um, like higher food cost. Um, so I'm just going to uh, do a round of introductions with our brand new panel. who are going to be talking about the uh, local community actions that we can take to transform the food system to meet global challenges. Um, as well as the individual actions that can be taken. So what you can do today to realistically um, support the food system and uh, address the challenges that I um, presented on earlier. Um, so Josie, would you mind starting with a brief introduction about yourself? <laughs> Hiya, um, my name's Jyoti. Um, I'm a farmer in Dorset. Um, I've, I've had a small holding family farm um, with my family for about 20 years. I've got four teenage daughters, so we're all grown up on the farm. Um, and we, um, well, basically we produce on a mixed farm and we sell directly to the local community. Um, and we have a processing room on our farm where we you know, process all sorts of um, products like apple juice, cheese, and you know different kinds of um, preserves uh, and you know pack loads of salad bags and that kind of thing and sell them at the local market but i'm a part of the land workers alliance which is a farmers union um for people who want to go back to the land in the uk for young people who want to get into farming get access to land and produce food for the local economy and also we're a part of la via campesina which is the international farmers union that um, Lynn mentioned before it represents 200 million farmers around the world. So, you know, it's all about kind of getting back to the land, growing food for our local community, getting good quality jobs in agriculture and food processing or retailing. And yeah, yeah just providing what we can for the local food economy. Thank you, Josie. Uh, Christina, could you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Christina. I am co-chair of Fight Back 2030 mm -hmm. uh, alongside Tasha, who was in the um, previous panel. And uh, it's a campaign that essentially aims to half child obesity by 2030 and promote um, the health of young people whilst fighting the injustices of the food industry. Thank you very much. Paul, could you introduce yourself next? Hi, Maya. Um, I'm Paul Cherry. I'm a farmer from North Hertfordshire. Um, we raise a, a um, range of combinable crops on, on a thousand hectares, uh, but also also a beef cattle. Um, and um, we've become very interested in in soil health so much so that we we've, we've started a conference called Groundswell, uh, which draws people from all over the world to to um, to engage and talk about uh, building soil health and all the and all the benefits that go with it. Um, uh, so I'll stop there. Great, thank you, Paul. And Heba. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Heba Osei-Kwesi. I'm a researcher, public health nutrition researcher at the University of Sheffield. I'm also a lecturer and I'm the founder of the um, social enterprise that we are just establishing. It's not registered yet. It's called Saharan Nutrition and it's going to help support people of, uh, from Africa, you know, African descent, with nutrition support, nutrition education and, and, and then health education in general. Thank you very much. Right, so we're going to start off um, with a question um, which has come in from Chris um, from uh, Green Spirituality. Um, and his question is, how can we support and expand community supported agriculture in the UK? Josie, would you like to start us off? Well, it's a great way that a local community can come together to um, grow food for themselves and also get a way to connect with the land so people can be connected to a farm without necessarily having to do all the farming themselves. Um, it, it, you know, community supported agriculture means that um, the community 
buys a bit of land or gets a community bit of land, hires a farmer to grow crops for them, invests in that farmer at the beginning of the season to give them the um, money for, to buy the seed or to get the feed for the animals or the fencing that they need, whatever it is, and shares in the risks and the rewards of that farming system. So it means, you know, the, the, the people that own part of that community supported agriculture farm can go and help harvest the crops. They can go and pick them up every week. You know, they can get involved in planting. It can be all sorts of things. And you can bring, you know, your kids with you um, and, and get them involved in some way on the land without having to do all the work themselves. But it allows the people that want to get into farming to have a fair wage for, for what they're doing and to know that they're not taking the risk on not being able to find somebody to buy their crops at the end of the season. It's, it's a great, it's a great system. So if you want to learn more about it, you can contact the CSA network or you can join the Land Workers Alliance and we can help you get something like that started. Thanks, JT. Um, would anyone else like to add anything else to uh, how we can expand and support um, community supported agriculture? Um, I think I'd just I'd like to say that uh, you know, if we're talking about um, food security, then we need to look at, um, at, at also at, at, um, uh, at, at slightly larger, you know, more. I, I'm, I'm not advocating industrial farming. I mean, I'm advocating something that is sustainable, more than sustainable, is actually regenerative. And, and um, I think. Um, Whilst I applaud CSA, I think I think this is about this is about food security going forward, and um, the only way to do is to to deal with that is to um, look after soils, uh, to 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 use our expertise to to um, to to regenerate the soils we've got and to to build on that. I think we mustn't get too distracted by the sort of um, anything too too sort of small scale if this is about food security yeah well, can you do both <laughs> you can do both yeah yeah, don't, yeah there's room for both. Really a lot of distractions absolutely okay so just um looking at the um un75 food security action plan that the expert working group came up with this morning um one of the actions was to um empower communities to transform their diets for health and sustainability whilst honoring cultural, traditional and the social importance of food. Now, this is something that we briefly touched on in the last panel, um, but I was wondering, Hubert, do you have any, um, uh, through your research, have you made any, uh, had any findings where um, there's a way of um, supporting this shift while also making sure that we honor the heritage um, and traditional aspects of food? Yes, yes, yes. Thanks, Maya. Yeah, so my research has um, focused on food consumption patterns of um, um, black minority ethnic groups. And indeed, um, um, focusing on culture and religion is something that we should be looking at when you're talking about sustainability in the food system. But unfortunately, we don't have a lot of research in this area. I mean, we, we, don't, we, we haven't looked at it so much when we're talking about the food system. We talk about everything else, but we leave this important bit when we are talking about food system. Now, my research focused on um, um, Ghanaians. You know, I was trying to look at um, um, African migrants and I tried to see um, what their dietary behaviors were and what were the determinants of these dietary behaviors. You know, there's this assumption that when people, like Black people, migrate to the UK and other high income countries, they abandon their traditional eating habits and then just adapt on healthy eating practices. You know, so that is what um, nutrition professionals will just focus on and advise these people. But on the contrary, my research found out that for those Black people that I studied, irrespective of the number of years they would have lived in the UK, they were still eating their traditional foods. Okay, so, so the issue here was not the fact that they were eating you know, um, um, fish and chips or you know, the usual things that we think about, because all of them were still maintaining their traditional, tra their traditional foods. Okay? So it's important we understand what is going on for certain groups of people, especially the vulnerable people, like, like the BAME community that we know uh, tend to be low income earners. You know, what is the state of their nutrition? What are their dietary behaviors? What, what, what influences on healthy behavior? Because as we all know, um, people don't just eat unhealthy just because they want to. There's so many challenges. There's so many. I, I, there are good reasons why people have bad behaviors. Okay, so we need to understand these reasons for us to be able to come together, work together, and get sustainable 
interventions. Otherwise, whatever we do will not be sustainable. If we are not looking at it with, with, from that perspective, it is just our understanding of what the problems are. And this might not be the problem, like what I found in my study. Another example I would just like to mention has to do with food banks. So there are so many more income Sorry, Anna, sorry, we're just getting a little bit of yeah. feedback. Could you speak, speak slightly slower? Right, okay, okay, yeah. So, so I also want to touch on food plants. And, you know, so when I said this, this group of people, they were, is it better, the feedback? I think it's slightly more understandable. Like, we still get the feedback, but we can follow. Far away, maybe it's from my phone, I don't know. You know, and I realized that, even though there were some low income earners within the population that I studied, they were, they said they did not utilize the food banks. And this population was in Greater Manchester. And there's so many food banks in Greater Manchester. So I wanted to find out why were they not using the food banks, even though they, you know, it was available, just a stone throw from where they lived. And then one of the reasons was the fact that um, the food was not culturally appropriate. Okay, so a lot of people were like, when we go, we'll be given a can of soup, and we don't know how to eat that. And now, um, this was just for black community in Greater Manchester. I also just found in a, a paper that was a study that was conducted in Bradford that this was a similar thing finding in a research that was conducted among South Asians in Bradford. So the government or you know organizations spent so much money on food banks for these people without consulting them, without working with them. And then they, they, they end up not utilizing these, these, these interventions or these, these services, okay? So there is a need for us to work with the community to understand what their needs are. Let, let them do that themselves. Let them do the needs assessment themselves. And then they, they can find or come up with solutions and solutions that they will own, okay? So that this can be sustainable. Yeah, so really empowering those communities to identify their own ways of adapting to the sustainability challenge and the health challenge. Um, and I think that this is something that came up in the expert working group as well, is that um, more localized food systems do not necessarily um, serve communities where um, many people are either here as a result of colonialization um, or um, who are here as a result of immigration. So I think that's a really important consideration to take forward when we think we need to transform our food systems, that we have both, you know, localized food systems, but that we also maybe um, ensure that we can still access foods that are culturally important. Um, great. Would anyone like to add anything to that? Okay. Um, sorry, yeah, Tina. So, sorry. Um, so the summer that just passed, summer 2020, I took part in the uh, Lambeth and Southwark Food and Farm Programme, which essentially um, was aimed at young kids in Lambeth and Southwark, the two most disadvantaged um, uh, area, boroughs of London in terms of child obesity um, and the like. And what I found was, so there was different types of schemes. I worked in my community centre and helped with the take and make boxes. And the kids, all from disadvantaged areas, majority black, learned how to grow their own um, fruit and veg, and then learned with me to cook. And there was a real sense of, you know, that the food wasn't foreign to them, and yet it was still healthy and nutritious. So I definitely feel like and, you know, we delivered over 150,000 meals, I think, over the course of the summer. So we can do community projects like that on a massive scale. I think that when we think community, yes, it is small, but, you know, small adds up to big. And if every, if we had a strong community in every borough and every town, then the change that we want to see is not that unreachable. So... That's a very great point. Thank you, Christina. Um, so that almost ties into one of the other action points that came out from the expert working group. And that was really um, setting up community schemes that allow local food production and seasonal eating. Um, and I don't know if any of you have been involved in any, well, I'm, I imagine Josie has, um, but uh, involved in schemes that allow local food production and really inviting people into this world of um, growing your own food and where food comes from.
We've been really looking at like uh, peri developing peri-urban farms or farms on the outskirts of cities. Um, I've been working with um, a, a colleague of mine, Dee Woods, who, uh, you know, it works with Grenville Community Kitchen in the middle of London. And, um, you know, with their community kitchen, they're, you know, they're, they're trying to provide healthy, fresh, you know, locally sourced foods to, to, you know, to the community in a culturally appropriate way and addressing you know, people that, you know, couldn't really afford, you know, very high end food products. Uh, they're looking at buying a farm, but also we're doing something where we're working with farmers in the in the southwest here where I am. I'm in Dorset um, th so that we can supply to London um, foods that are organic, that are re grown regeneratively. Like I, I raise lamb here on my farm and, you know, there's a, a farmer down the road that can and do beef as well. And, you know, the, the wholesale price we can get for that food, actually, if we sold that ho wholesale and directly straight into a community, uh, you know, in, in the middle of London without putting that high markup on it or we use the cut to meat you know like you know like the neck like the tail those sorts of things that aren't as sellable around here we can sell that really high quality meat at a quite affordable price directly to the consumer and if we can set up those supply chains we can be supplying volumes of food directly to people in food deserts um so that they can have access to good food and we need more of those kind of projects and a focus on addressing po food poverty and food deserts in that really dignified way it's not all about cheap supermarkets and cheap food Thanks, JT. That's, that sounds amazing. Um, right, so I'm just going to ask a question from, uh, we've got a question from the viewers. Um, Charlotte has asked, um, how can local food production systems successfully integrate with national and global food systems, acknowledging the fact that we need both? Um, Paul, would you like to uh, start on that one? Yeah, I, um, I think the, 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 one of the problems with, with, um, with this is, is local we, we've got very bad at local i'm i'm a beef producer and um uh there's no such thing as, as a local abattoir anymore so trying to trying to get into a, a in, into the local market becomes incredibly laborious and very expensive got to go to a big abattoir a long way away um got to deal with to deal with a deal 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 with carcasses and it's all it's all become um it's all become a problem. We've got. We've really lost touch with with um, with the uh, the local market around here. Um, farmers markets have all have almost died because I just we tried we tried engaging with farmers markets and um, it um, there just wasn't the support from 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 the um, from the community. So it it basically fizzled out. Um, I can't really put my finger on why. You know why it's so complicated, but certainly the, it's the experience with the avatars that, that um, seems to be the problem for me. Thank you very much. Okay, then um, I I'm just going to uh, move on to another point that was in the um, UN75 um, action plan. Um, and so th again, this is a draft, viewers. So um, if you have any great ideas that you think should be part of this. Um, UN75 uh, Food Security Action Plan, please put them in the questions and um, people can upvote them if they like them um, and it just increases the chance of it being incorporated. Um, so one of the actions that um, can be taken on an uh, individual level to transform the food system to meet global challenges um, was identified as joining a movement to oppose food system injustices. And so this may be, um, you know, the racial injustices that exist in our food system, um, might be environmental injustices, um, animal welfare problems, um, even um, just things like lack of transparency. Um, so Christina, can you maybe, um, maybe speak to uh, how you became involved as a young person um, in, uh, Act, activism, essentially, uh, what you're doing with Bike Back 2030. Yeah, so um, I'm quite an intersectional youth activist, so I fight on racial, racial and climate fronts as well. So food really does tie it all together. Um, and it was when I started getting involved in the climate movement, seeing how, you know, what I ate affected um the world around me um my my world our earth um that's when i really realized that you know 
okay, something has to be done. Then I joined Bite Back and then I learned so much about just joining that movement, just making that decision was kind of, it. okay, yes, it was active, but it was very passive in the fact that just being in that environment, you learn so much, like you genuinely don't have to, you know, devote your life to this to see how the food system works and what you have to do to change it. So um, yeah, then I became very like aware of what was going on. I became infuriated on, on many different fronts because of the manipulation um, from the advertisement industry to, you know, disproportionately target, target um, fame, uh, you know, disadvantaged areas in the UK. And also just the fact that, you know, why is it that I can get a 99p burger and not a nutritionist a nutritious meal for the same price things like that um that really got me and the rest of the um uh youth board infuriated and that led to me launching the free school meal provisions campaign to extend um free school meal provisions over the school holidays because the government was not doing that um and yeah i've done loads and loads and loads of things that i never thought i really would do just because i joined a movement about something that I had cared about but did not know enough so yeah I, I think that it's so important as an individual and and it's not I don't think it's a thing of um privilege anymore which is which is a good thing because I'm you know I'm a black girl I come from a disadvantaged family I'm the daughter of immigrants you know on paper I shouldn't be able to do these things but I am so I think that just joining the movement and um opening yourself up to these opportunities are very very important because that's how you learn especially as a young person thank you christina um that's a brilliant i mean you're obviously a role model for uh many people but i think um i think many of us will be listening or many viewers will be listening to this and thinking okay actually maybe i don't need to be an expert in food in order to join a food movement um and yeah you will learn along the way so that's fantastic um, I have a question for Heba from actually uh, our other youth activist who is on the last panel, Asha. Um, she's asked, um, according to the Food Foundation, the poorest 10% of households only purchase three portions of fruit and vegetables per day. Um, what's the biggest driver of uh, lack of fruit and vegetable consumption amongst the poorest households? So, yes, I'll just like to take us to this report that was um, published. I don't know if people saw it. This about two years ago, Food Foundation did this study on um, the cost of eating the Eat Well Guide, the government's recommendation for a healthy meal. And then they found out that um, amongst the low income earners, um, about 80% of their income that would, you know, take care of, um, if they wanted to eat the UK's recommendation for a healthy diet, that would cost them about 80% of, of their income. Okay, so um, um, it is not surprising that, you know, the data shows that people just consume, I mean, the low income earners are having just three of the five a day, you know, because it is not cheap, it is expensive to try and eat the way the government has recommended. And Usually, when people are on low income, they have so many priorities and they would not prioritize healthy eating. That is usually the last thing on the list. They'll have to do everything else and then use what they have left to now take care of, 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 of their meals, number one. Number two, so that access, but on two levels, financial access is the main problem. But the other one has to do with just um, geographical access. A lot of these people live in food deserts live in areas where they just, even if they wanted to buy these foods, it's so difficult for them to, to have access to, to supermarkets with, you know, affordable fruits and vegetables, you know. So it's it's a combination of, of so many things. The underlying factor is the socioeconomic status, the inequalities that we keep talking about. That is the main driver of this, this big problem. Thanks, Heba. Um, I, yeah, I think it, it resonates with what we in uh, global food security have found repeatedly, which is that um, 
food poverty and poor diet is a symptom of genuine poverty. And actually, in order to um, address food poverty, we need to lift people out of poverty. And so I think that's why it's so important that we take a holistic approach. You can't just increase the number of food banks. You can't just make food cheaper because actually we're not paying the true cost of food and, uh, at the moment. And so the idea of making food even cheaper will just undercut farmers, means that they have to... Um, oh, sorry, uh, Heba, would you mind uh, turning off your uh, muting? Thank you. Um, so it just means that um, if we continue to make food cheaper, um, then we continue to push farmers to... Uh, either go bust or give up their um, strict environmental standards or welfare standards. Um, so it's incredibly important that we lift people out of poverty, um, ensuring that food remains affordable, um, not necessarily cheaper. Um, and uh, what's your perspective on that, Paul? I'm quite interested because you tend to um, have a more large scale um, yeah. food production. Well, you know, as you probably know, food is food in 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 certain in the UK is very very cheap as a proportion of the household budget. Um, maybe not globally, but let's talk about let's talk about what what we're, what's happening in, in certainly in Europe. So, food is very cheap. Um, it's I think it's too cheap. Um, it's uh, we treat it. Uh, you can tell it's cheap because there's too much of it, and that's why we waste so much of it. Um, and so um, uh, yeah, we do. We, we treat food very badly because it is so cheap. We throw it away because it's cheap, um, and um, possibly uh, it's um, you know, lack of quality, lack of everything. But the, the um, so it's it's such a complicated um, thing. But but as a as a subsidised farmer, like. Um, I'm encouraged to. I've been, you know, everything, everything in my DNA since the Second World War has been about producing more food. But now things are now. Now we're understanding the environmental um, uh, damage that farms are doing. We're going much more away from the sort of all-out food production and more into this this um, sustainable or regenerative sort of type food production, which is not about sort of. How big is your tractor? How many chemicals can you pour on your crops to grow the maximum? It's about just pre getting getting back to something that is it, it, that your soil can 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 deal with, and you're producing a, a health. So if your soil is healthier, you can produce crops more cheaply or cattle more cheaply. Don't spend so much money on them, and end up with maybe not so much of them, but a better quality that maybe. Will somehow filter through the food chain, and um, uh, you know, and we end up with eating better food. Um, I haven't explained it very well, but that's sort of roughly what I'm trying to trying to get at. No, I fully I fully agree as well that we need to uh, that we can if we can produce less but better food that can, is more nutrient dense because we've taken care of the soils, then um, that automatically means that we won't need to waste, we won't be wasting as much food, we won't be wasting as much resources. Um, one of the more, more troubling statistics is that as um, atmospheric amounts of CO2 increase, um, we found that uh, the nutritional contents of food actually goes down. So um, there's a, by, by the lobbyists who um, promotes uh, fossil fuel industry, they, they like to say that, you know, Plants eat CO2, so um, if we have more CO2 in the atmosphere, then plants are going to do better. But actually, um, the nutritional content of food goes down, of plant-based food goes down as atmospheric CO2 increases. So um, I completely agree with your point that we need to be focusing on making sure that we have high-quality, nutrition-packed food um, so that we don't need to produce as much of it in order to get the same nutrients. I was just wondering, Josie, if you could uh, maybe expand slightly on how your um, your farm ensures that um, healthy, sustainably produced food remains affordable um, to uh, the wider community. Well, I mean, you do have to charge a price that makes it um, worth it to, to, to do it. 
you know, to gr to grow. And if you're going to pay fair wages to people, then it it does need to cost something. But I think there there is a bit of a problem with thinking about the idea that everything needs to be left to the market. You know, somehow the government's moving towards you know that food needs to be left completely to the market, and we pay public money for public goods. But if you think about access to food, equitable access to food, you know, fair a fair type of food security then that's actually a public good itself you know and and the government does need to intervene in some way and that's where like if we have right to food legislation it means that the government has to intervene to make sure that people can access good food while farmers at the same time can get a fair price for doing things well you know if they look after their animals well if they look after the soil if they make sure that they're doing things properly then government needs to give some money towards that to make sure food still stays affordable and that people can have access to it no matter where they live or whatever income level they are and that that's subsidizing a public good um so you know we, right now the subsidy system is changing um and you know farmers are going to be paid for looking after the environment and that is right that they should be paid you know to, to try and make sure that when they do environmental things and they have lower productivity they still get a fair living but if they're you know but also the government needs to intervene and put money in when people can't afford good food to make sure we've got projects where people can sell food at a good price but there's some sort of government subsidy that makes it affordable or we need to work through things like solidarity boxes or people you know paying a bit more for their food who can afford it and that's subsidizing people who can't afford it to be able to get that good quality food um you know or sell direct to consumer cut out the middle people you know there's all sorts of ways you can do it but we have to make that a real priority and it needs to be something where we invest as a society in making sure that happens that's brilliant thank you um so one of the questions that's been asked by bart um is what's the panel's view on modern bioscience development so lab produced meats genetic modification and gene edited crops um, to increase yields um, and particularly making ones that allow them to become more climate resilient. Um, also things like biofortified foods so that plants become more nutritious. And I just spoke, but I certainly <laughs> do. <laughs> Please do. Please do respond to that. I mean, there's a huge amount of agrodiversity out there, uh, you know, pl uh, across the planet of different sorts of foods um, and many, many different climate resilient seeds that are being bred by farmers all across the world, which are open source, can be saved and bred and adapted where they're, where they're grown to be, to be more climate resilient. And, you know, if you plant a diversity of different crops um, and especially using those very adaptable seed varieties, then you can have a really, you know, some, uh, a seed that can be saved and, and used for free um, by farmers and that's open source that isn't the same as genetically modified technologies that is just as climate resilient. And, and actually we're not putting all our eggs into the basket and it's not controlled by multinational corporations. So I think, you know, if we're looking at what we need to invest in, it should be investing in, you know, adapting, adaptable seed, open source seed, traditional seed varieties and, and developing better capability for mixed farming systems rather than these kind of, um, technologies that are controlled by multinational corporations that farmers have to pay for year after year. Thank you. Would you like to add something, Paul? Yeah, my, my, my experience is, is, is that um, seeds, that the sort of wheat that we grow has been has been bred and bred and bred to be more and more reliant on, on um, high input sort of fertilizers, chemicals, fungicides, that sort of thing. And, and um, uh, we're now turning the corner, going back to sort of more heritage wheats, which you can grow almost without any without any inputs at all. Um, you probably have a little bit, but but you know, but but get away from this sort of reliance. And the, 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 these milling wheats have been not only bred to be to be massively high yielding, but they're also um, suited to the modern um, uh, milling systems. Which, as we know, aren't particularly good for you, and you know, so so, so um, yeah, um, 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 we're, we're we're trying to get back to a, to a, 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 a back to some more basic sort of farming practice. Back to, uh, I mean, you know, obviously rotating crops goes on anyway, but but back to to healthy soils, health, healthy crops, and there and healthy people. That's brilliant. Um, Heba, just, uh, just asking you, um, 
so do you think that fortification would be a common thing to address, um, say, uh, malnutrition in um, low-income communities? Sorry, Mia, I didn't hear the question. I don't know what's wrong with my line, but... That's all right. Um, I was just asking if you think that biofortification has the potential to actually address some of the malnutrition that exists in um, uh, low-income communities in the UK. So... Um, when it comes to malnutrition, as we all know, the causes are multifaceted, okay? So, yes, that is one of the potential, but it, it is not the only way, because um, when I was doing my, I mean, it, it's one of the ways, but to do more than that, that's what I wanted to say. When I was doing my research, um, I spoke to some people and they were like, even let's take the basic one, like telling people to eat five a day. People were like, we know all that, Okay. If, 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 if I go to the hospital and I'm given a brochure, I, I will throw it away because people have deep seated challenges that they are facing. There are so many problems that people are going through, the inequalities we talk about. You know, These are the things we need to focus on. So, social determinants and not, 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 not just these uh, uh, basic ones we are talking about. We can start from there, but we need to go beyond that when we are talking about vulnerable communities. And the main thing has to do with your socioeconomic status. People need to be empowered. They need to be taken out of their, 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 their poverty, for lack of word, first. Okay, that is, that is one of the ways we can help people in, in, in those communities. If they still live in poverty, if people struggle to get their basic needs, whatever we do would not make an impact. They need to be taken out of that situation first. And then all these other things will now make a difference. Yeah, so yes, it can be one of the ways, but it has to be done together with so many others. And for people who wouldn't know about it, they would need a, a bit of education. They would need to be um, 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 educated about the importance of taking all those things into consideration. Thank yeah. you, Hiva. That's really thorough and very, very clear. Um, and I think it plays into something that um, I think a lot of us uh, in society are waiting for some kind of, you know, silver bullet to uh, address food system problems that we have. And, um, you know, you look into those um, kind of dystopian uh, films and books and they've got just some kind of nutrition powder that they put in their water and it has everything they need but um, really food system transformation is not going to be um, achieved through one or two um, strategies it's going to be uh, almost like this food system will go down a death by a thousand cuts um, and so we need all these tiny little things feeding into it in order to uh, actually make any substantial change in such a complex and multifaceted food system. Um, I just want to, before we, sorry, um, before we wrap up, um, I'd just like to ask each of the panel members, um, what would you say um, individuals watching tonight can do to um, support um, the transformation of our food system um, to address global challenges. And Christina, I'd like to start with you, if that's okay. What's the one thing that you think people can do today? Cool. Um, I said pay attention um, is the number one thing because uh, I feel like food is very overlooked. It's just not, um, as it has said perfectly, it's just not people's priority. But um, I think edu because there's a massive, massive lack of education um, on agriculture, on the food system. We just need to kind of take it upon ourselves to um, try and engage if we can, and if not, help those that can't, um, whether that be through joining a movement, whether that be through um, writing, your, writing a, a letter to your MP, writing an email. There are very, very simple ways to get involved. You just have to kind of pay attention to what's going on around you. Thank you, Christina. Um, JC, would you like to go next? Yeah, Christina is another one of my heroes. <laughs> and I know about you because I have four teenage daughters <laughs> and, they, and they follow you. Um, so yeah, no, it, I mean, it's not, you know, you, you, should, you should definitely like try and buy good food, find out more about the politics of the food system and what is good food and invest in that. But that's not the only thing that you can do. I hear a lot of people saying you can vote with your pocketbook, but you can actually just go and vote and you can make sure you vote for the people that aren't doing things 
you know, ripping down our food standards and things and like actually push back if they're not doing in government what we need them to do to create a better food system. And, and we really need to educate ourselves to be empowered enough to understand that, you know, that, that what's happening on the global level food system, all the things that these agri-tech lobbyists and people are, are saying needs to be unpicked and, and we can't let them get away with dominating the narrative of what happens with our food system. Our food, What's happening to our food system not only affects us every time we eat, every single day and when we sit around the table with whoever we sit around, whether it's our family or our community or, or sitting on our own, uh, you know, it, it also affects our, our whole future. You know, it's, a, it's an absolute foundational part of the planetary crisis we're facing right now and if we can't do something about reversing that then we're reversing you know those nice dinners on the table for our grandchildren and their grandchildren and, and you know the generations after that so we've got to do something about it and people have to be educated about it and really act on it thank you jc and um, paul would you like to give everyone your one um one thing that they can take home and start doing today I would say um, uh, I would say buy ingredients, and t t t you know, and 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 build your and enjoy food because if you buy the ingredients, it's very cheap, and you can build your food. And I would also say um, that if you're buying, if you're going to enjoy meat, then then ask where it's come from. Too much meat is is um, is industrially produced, and if you ask. Uh, if you want to buy some 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 beef, don't be afraid of asking. Has it been produced on pasture? Uh, and if it has, then it then it is um, it it is um, it's doing as much good as it is as harm. Beef's got this really bad reputation because of all the methane and stuff. Beef produced on grass, the the um, the carbon it is part of the carbon cycle. The the amount of carbon that the that the soil that it's growing on. Um, the, the amount of bugs in the soil can more than absorb all the methane. So ignore the bad press, enjoy beef, and buy ingredients. Thanks, Paul. Um, and Heba, do you have a really short... Short message, two things. Well, to everyone else, now is the time for us to act. You know, everyone should try for people, because I always focus on the food consumption level you know, dietary behaviors for people who are struggling. Let's just start with very small changes. You know, just one thing, if you're having three a day, three fruits a day, let's try and then add one to it, knowing the importance of it. Despite all the challenges, let's just try and put in much more effort and add one fruit. Then gradually we can get to that five a day. Second message to people, professionals, nutrition professionals who work with um, 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 people from the BAME community. It is important that we build cultural competence. It is important that we try to understand the challenges that these people face. So, that, you know, we can, um, in, in trying to come up with um, interventions, suggest interventions that are culturally um, targeted or context specific to these group of people. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Jyoti, Christina, Paul and Heba for being on our local panel this evening and for your really valuable contributions. Um, thank you as well to the viewers for um, posting all your amazing questions. Um, they have been noted and uh, we will be seeing if we can incorporate them into our UN75 Food Security Action Plan. Um, time um i hope you have an amazing week and i hope that you've learned something useful this evening um and if you want any more information please go to our website um we are on um, www.foodsecurity.ac.uk um, and you'll be able to find a wealth of resources there um, you're also able to follow me on twitter uh, at maya gfs and uh, I will be happy to answer any of your questions that unfortunately are still outstanding. <laughs>